Hello, this is Bill Greenwood. I'm here uh, to help describe the move of the steam engine 4978 and the caboose uh, from Ottawa to Mendota, Illinois. Uh, we'll be giving you a description throughout this tape about what took place in the move. We hope you'll find it of interest. And assisting me on this will be uh, a longtime operating friend of mine from Burlington, Northern, uh, Jerry Pinkapank. Jerry? Hi, this is Jerry Pinkapank, uh, as Bill said, a former Burlington Northern operating officer and also uh, had some contact with steam operation on other railroads. Uh, and maybe from that perspective, we'll be able to add a little bit. The 4978 was built by Baldwin Locomotive Works in 1922 for the Chicago, Burlington and Quincy Railroad. Uh, the engine is a Mikado type engine with a 282 wheel arrangement. Now the caboose was built in 1911 by the Burlington's shops in Aurora, Illinois. Both of these pieces of equipment were donated to the LaSalle County Historical Society in May of 1965 by the railroad shortly after both units were taken out of service. There were dozens and dozens of volunteers involved in this movement. A lot of work had to be done. Uh, for example, here you see Steve Shutt and Leo McCauley both working under the caboose. A sling from the boom of the crane was attached to the caboose so that the caboose could be very carefully lifted uh, and set down so it could later be positioned onto the highway truck. The reason that the caboose was moved by highway rather than rail is because the railroads no longer allow any uh, pieces of equipment moved that have uh, wood components in their trucks. Uh, Jerry, would you tell us a few things uh, that are really interesting about the trucks uh, that the caboose rode on? Yes, Bill. The wooden cabooses on the Burlington, which continued in service in some places uh, uh, 60 miles an hour uh, and greater into the uh, late 1960s, were rolling exhibits of 1880 passenger car truck technology. Uh, the uh, bolster, the, the cross piece uh, on which the center plate is mounted, was a big piece of oak, and so were the side frames, the, the two uh, top members uh, that you see uh, that the truck mechanism is connected to. Then bolted to that were the pedestals, uh, which were castings uh, in which the journal box that has the axle end moved up and down. Uh, and the uh, uh, spring assemblies and drop equalizer that you see there that handled the suspension were metal, but the main bearing members of the truck were oak. Even after the trucks were removed from under the caboose, the stovepipe at the top of the caboose had to be lowered in order for the uh, load to fit under the highway bridges in the move to Mendota. The move was 30 miles, and the entire operation took place in just one day, and that included retrucking the uh, caboose at its new location in Mendota.
Here are a few comments from Steve Shutt, who was responsible for both organizing and executing the move of the caboose and the engine. It came off even easier than it went on, and it was a very smooth operation. I figured five hours for the whole thing, and what are we at, about? Uh, I got uh, quarter to one. 7.30 to quarter to one is five and a half, five and a half hours. Yeah. Right on time. Yeah. How about that drop? when they put it down that on the wheels. That was so smooth. Oh, on the trucks. That was the best feeling there is, you know. <laughs> Thank was... God it's done. You know, we're, we're down, we're a third of the way there. Center like a pro. Yeah. We got, the next part's gonna be the toughest part. But it's, gonna, it's gonna go as smooth. We've got a few things to get ready for it. Here you see Scott Lindsay of Steam Operations Corporation of Birmingham, Alabama, assisting us in the necessary preparations to ready the locomotive for movement. Jerry, tell us a little about that. The 4978 was put into its display with uh, its pistons and piston rods intact. And in order to move a locomotive uh, in that condition, in order to keep compressed air from building up, it's necessary to take the rods down. Uh, this was always done in the days of revenue service with steam locomotives uh, when they were being moved uh, to the shop for heavy repairs. So what's being done here is what would have been done to 4978 many times in her life just to take her to West Burlington for heavy shop work. Here the eccentric crank is being removed, uncovering the main pin. And now with a small movement back in order to uh, free it uh, from the crosshead, the crosshead end of the main rod will drop. And now the rod is being freed from the main pin. This had to be done on each side of the locomotive, of course, and the usual practice uh, was to carry the main rods on the tender uh, with the locomotive as it went to the back shop. You can see here on the rods the, uh, the Babbitt metal bushings that were uh, used to provide a wearing surface between the pin, uh, which was of hard steel, uh, and the rod itself, which was also of hard steel. These Babbitt castings were uh, easily replaced in the shop and uh, lasted for perhaps uh, 200,000 mile intervals, uh, or if they wore more rapidly, could be replaced in the roundhouse between heavy shoppings. The Babbitt metal portion is that uh, uh, different colored ring at the interior of the uh, of the opening there in the rod. It's not quite so evident on the main pin here because of rust. Mendota's Hulcher division was used for moving the locomotive about 3,000 feet from its display site uh, to the point where it was to be put on the rail. You see here a speed swing arriving on the back of this flatbed truck. There will also be a a uh, side boom cat with a big counterbalance on the one side of it and uh, then two other truckloads of panel rail followed these in shortly. This equipment is normally used for clearing derailments. Here the panel rail is being picked off of the flatbed truck with a side boom cat and uh, this panel rail is constructed uh, at Hulcher's facility in Mendota each panel is about 39 feet in length, and there will be a total of 10 that will be used in the operation. And when the panel has been rolled over by the locomotive or pulled over by the locomotive, then the side boom cat will go back and pick up the panel that had been passed over and then carried over to the front so that it's a continuous operation. Panel rail is normally used for replacing the damaged rail during uh, the cleanup operation from a derailment.
Steam Operations Corporation personnel are using alamite guns to lubricate the rods before the move and applying a uh, uh, packing uh, to the journal on the tender. Of course, this locomotive has not moved in, uh, in 30 or 40 years, and uh, it was necessary to pay a lot of attention to lubrication before the first movement, and much of this preparatory work was done beforehand. These are compromise joints linking the panel to the display rail. That's the first 10 panel segment, and as Bill explained, it'll be leapfrogged uh, as they continue to pull, to, uh, pull the locomotive. This uh, uh, coupler pulling ring has been substituted for the drawbar in order to get a better grip than you would have putting the hook against the regular coupler knuckle, uh, which might not stand up to the odd angles that it's being pulled at uh, by the uh, side boom cats. Now it begins to move for the first time in something like 40 years. fairly easy to lubricate the uh, the tender and the uh, trailing truck and we'll see the pilot truck shortly. Uh, a more difficult uh, question was the lubrication of the main driving wheels, which as you'll see here shortly uh, are rolling very smoothly. See the, uh, by the way, that the eccentric crank has been put back on. Uh, and it, the behind the hub of this driving wheel is something called a driving box. There's a big a slug of grease at the bottom of it, and then a brass bearing held within the frame. And it was necessary for the Steam Operations Corporation people to get at that driving box and uh, replace the, uh, the grease where necessary and make sure that the wedges which hold the uh, box were uh, tight and uh, ready to hold the, uh, the lubricant against the, uh, uh, the bearing uh, as the uh, locomotive made its run up to Mendota. So all that preparation work had gone on uh, weeks before. Coming up here, we'll see the, uh, the way the pilot truck is suspended just by a single pin uh, that goes up to the frame right behind the pilot, as the uh, commonly called the cow catcher, uh, by civilians, we'll say. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, the trailing truck is a little more complicated as its uh, as suspension uh, is a kind of a triangle from uh, under the firebox. But the pilot truck is, is very simple and it was lubricated simply by uh, uh, reaching right over the top deck there uh, uh, behind the coupler and uh, the pin actually sticks up right through the deck at that point. It can be reached for lubrication. The rail is being positioned in place here and as you can see, it uh, is quite flexible. Normally one might think that rail is very rigid, uh, but in fact it is put together in quarter mile sections uh, and transported on flat cars and can negotiate curves uh, by bending with the curve. And that same flexible principle was applied here in moving the panel uh, because at one point uh, a 90 degree turn has to be made and so the rail is gradually uh, pulled in the direction of the turn that has to be made by the machines. As you can see here, the locomotive is moving quite easily. And there is one machine that would be positioned in the, uh, to the rear of it, pulling it. And then there would be another machine uh, at the front of the locomotive to uh, keep the tension on it so that it doesn't uh, get away from them and uh, here the bucket on the speed swing is eased up against the rail and this is the manner in which they will then push the panel very gently in the direction that the move is desired to be made. This is Tim Wamhoff giving the direction. He is the superintendent of the Hulter Division in Mendota. Because the locomotive is moving very freely and they are going down a slight hump in the track that uh, there is a very visible braking action being provided by uh, this uh, speed swing at the front of the locomotive by pulling back against the locomotive's movement. The crescent-shaped objects in each wheel are called counterbalances. If they were not present, the large off-center weight represented by the main pin on the main driver and the connecting rod pins on each of the other drivers would cause the locomotive to ride very roughly and probably derail itself. 
the uh, counterbalances are actually supplemented by lead weights that are added at the shop uh, and carefully balanced like the wheel balancing done on the tire of your automobile, but on a much larger scale. Here, wheel chocks are being positioned in order to hold the locomotive in place. Work continued the first night to under lights well into the evening. It's the next morning. Even after 4978 reaches live rail at the end of this day, it is nevertheless a long unused industrial track and still a quarter of a mile from a regularly operated rail. Conductor Pat Reed, Scott Lindsay and his assistant Gary, and museum volunteers Leo Mulock, Alan Russell, and Steve Shutt discuss this problem. Well, the problem we, we've got, what time do you plan on being here Saturday morning? I, just as soon as we can get here. Well, daylight. We can't leave Mendota. <laughs> we can't leave Mendota till 6 a.m. Okay. And then we get to Montgomery and shoot right down here. That's yeah. why I say. So if we're we... looking at 10 o'clock. Well, I'm I'm hoping to be here before 10. Good. I'm so hoping we, to be here before 10. So we need the engine out there where we don't have to do deal with any of this. And if if you guys can push it out even during the week, you know Thursday, get it up there. Well, I just and have somebody sit. With I just it. told Alan, uh, even a a bucket. We'll pull it. It's oh, rolling yeah. good. You can pull it. It's uphill, so you don't have to worry about it. It's going to go against you. Chain it to it. Well, we're going right to need up four or five guys before we start doing that, so we can chuck the wheels. But as you go, sure. Yeah. If anything happens, you just you know have a chain to them. But it's the, uh, that uh, bucket or whatever they call them. They can pull it. And well, just get it up one, on the yeah. <laughs> Then I'm going to go I up there think a again. I would make that. Well, Holcher is here. We'll have him go through and look look at everything. We'll check the gauge all the way out. We can put some. Uh, it, it looked good, like I said. I mean, but I can't, look, you know, bring our engine in there. No. In here That's, now, it even doesn't look that bad. A very difficult phase is about to begin because a 90 degree turn has to be accomplished. Jerry, tell us, was this locomotive designed to negotiate this type of curve? Well, Bill, what they had to do, of course, was make the, uh, the turn in a, uh, in a radius that would comply with the specifications the locomotive was designed for. Uh, in this case, it was designed for about a 318-foot radius curve. And they observed uh, very carefully uh, that they stayed within that radius uh, as they were laying the panel, pulling the panel over. You'll see that the man is lubricating uh, the rail the purpose of this is to reduce the coefficient of friction between the flange and the rail so that there is not a tendency of the wheel to climb. Uh, however, after 33 years, uh, the uh, locomotive had gotten a little arthritic, and uh, in spite of the best efforts, uh, one of the tender trucks is about to derail. And here you see the result. Hulcher's business being re-railing, there was no problem, especially because the center pin on this particular truck uh, permitted it to uh, uh, remain attached to the, uh, the frame of the tender as they lifted. So this uh, re-railing was accomplished in short order. Uh, shortly, you'll see uh, Hulcher Superintendent Tim Wamhoff uh, come in and make the, the final move uh, with his foot, uh, just pushing that flange over to the other side of the rail, and she drops in place. After the re-railing operation, the engine was rolled back uh, to permit re-inspection of the track. They were careful of the gauge. It's easy when pulling panel around to get the track parallelogrammed and uh, get out of gauge. And uh, they also made some adjustments uh, in the tie spacing, uh, uh, sort of like the differential axle uh, problem. You've got to angle the ties uh, because the, uh, uh, the outer rail of the curve uh, is a, uh, a larger circumference than the inner. And they were very careful to be sure that they had a uh, perfectly smooth route for the 4978 to follow as it went through the next stage of being pulled through this uh, difficult part of the uh, maneuver. The 
the real proof of the pudding was that the really difficult uh, rigid wheelbase of the driving wheels uh, transited this uh, curve without any difficulties. Uh, this is when the design of the locomotive uh, is specified for this 318 foot radius, it's that rigid driving wheelbase that they have in mind. Uh, the truck actually ought to have been able to negotiate uh, a much uh, tighter curve than it did and uh, there was a mechanical difficulty with it that caused it to derail. Well, we finally are back on straight track again on the street, and this is a good illustration where the ties do their job in spreading the weight evenly from this 150-ton locomotive without doing any damage to the street. And there's even time for a photo opportunity. Jerry, as we will be getting some good side views of this locomotive, would you describe to us uh, some of the mechanical features of the 4978? Yes, Bill. 4978, being built in 1922, had a lot of what are described as modern uh, accessory features. Uh, for example, it had a stoker, and it was a feed water uh, heater-equipped locomotive. One of the things we can see here is the Elesco feed pump, which is the uh, right above the, right now coming over the head of the man with the red hard hat. Uh, that took water from the tender and pumped it up to a bundle uh, right ahead of the stack of, of that was tubes of the live steam that preheated the water so that when it entered the boiler, it entered at a higher temperature and that increased the efficiency of the locomotive. Just to the right of the screen, we can see those two circles. Uh, that's the stoker engine. That instead of having the fireman fire the locomotive entirely by hand, there was a stoker screw that ran under the tender. It was driven by that engine, and it pulled coal forward. And then there was a uh, device to spread the coal uh, across the uh, grate. Uh, the grate actually lies above that uh, horizontal object that passes along the right side of the screen there. Uh, that's the ash pan. Uh, the coal burned above that ash pan and then dropped into the grate and at the engine terminals they would uh, dump the, that ash pan and, and remove the cinders and clinker. Here we see by the way the uh, this leapfrogging move being made with the panel. Uh, the panel is being uh, run around to the other end so that they can progress the next 10 panel lengths uh, with the engine. There are two more big turns to be negotiated before reaching live rail. And you now see the uh, panel rail uh, being positioned for those curves that have yet to be made. Here we see the cross compound air pump which supplied air to the uh, air brakes on the locomotive and for the following train. It's opposite the feed pump, uh, which is on the left side. And right above the headlight is that Elesco feed water heater I mentioned earlier that preheats the feed water going into the boiler. The feed pump pumps to it, and from it, the water goes to the boiler. Work went on under lights provided by the Ottawa Civil Defense Unit well past midnight. Here the panel rail is prepared for connection to the industry spur, the one that had not been used for several years. Here is a good opportunity to identify some of the features of the, the top silhouette of the locomotive, sometimes called the skyline of the locomotive. Starting over from the left, uh, you have the Alesco feed water heater that we discussed earlier, right ahead of the stack, which is obvious there, painted with aluminum paint. Behind the stack, you see a dome. Uh, that's the sandbox, or sand dome. And there's piping from it, uh, both to the uh, rear of the driving wheels and to the front of the driving wheels, so that traction sand can be let down under air pressure uh, to, the, uh, uh, to assist the locomotive in maintaining traction uh, when the railhead is slippery from rain or other causes. Then behind it is the steam dome, uh, where the throttle valve is located. Then as we continue to the right across the uh, top of the boiler, 
Uh, at the apex of the boiler, you see the uh, cluster of three safety valves and the whistle. Uh, those three safety valves were set at three different pressures uh, uh, so that they would come in in sequence uh, as the uh, pressure rose. Uh, then going further towards the cab, uh, you see another uh, object projecting upwards. That's the exhaust of the steam turbo generator that provided the electricity for the locomotive. It lit the headlight, the lights in the cab, and lights, ground lights around the locomotive. Uh, finally, immediately ahead of the cab is a cluster of objects. Uh, this is called the valve turret, and this distributed steam to the various accessories, such as the uh, feed pump that we've discussed that's visible on this side, and the air pump, which is out of sight on the other side, the stoker engine under the cab, which we've pointed out earlier, uh, and uh, other uh, steam accessories uh, on the locomotive. The red roof uh, often is a cause of commentary. Uh, this was not really decoration uh, in the 1920s and really thereafter. The best waterproofing material to put over a steel cab was naturally red in color and it was simply used uh, in its natural state. <laughs>